welcome back to the channel. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you guys today about a game called Infra. And what is Infra? Well, uh, that's kind of hard to pin down, and uh, I think that's probably one of the best selling points of the game, is it, it is a little bit genre-defying. At first glance, it's going to look like a sort of walking simulator, maybe just some sort of open-world exploration sort of thing. Um... But it's not quite a walking simulator. It's very heavily uh, reliant on, on puzzles and traversal puzzles and logic puzzles and things like that. And uh, so is it a puzzle game? Uh, um, yes and no, it's not entirely puzzles. Um, there's also sort of a resource management survival aspect to it as well. Um, so it's kind of hard to pin down. So in Infra, you play as a guy named Mike or Michael. Or, excuse me, no, Mark, whose last name I didn't catch. And he is a sort of structural engineer, uh, civil engineer, and uh, he is a consultant, or rather, he works for a consulting firm who, it's unclear if uh, property owners or the local government has hired them to um, evaluate uh, different properties that have been acquired recently, um, if they're structurally sound, if they need to be condemned, if repairs need to be made. Um, so, uh, Mark is sent out into the field, uh, with his trusty flashlight, his hard hat, a, uh, you know, bright green, you know, visibility jacket, and, uh, a camera to kind of visually inspect and then document whatever he can about these properties, you know, and make recommendations for repairs, um, or the viability of the property. For example, the first level of the game starts uh, starts at a hydroelectric dam. You'll use your camera as a way to document uh, the environment. One of the unique aspects of that is that you're going to be traveling through and, and exploring these large industrial environments, you know, abandoned industrial facilities, you know, dams, factories, steelworks, foundries, things like that. And um, in, a, in a typical game, you'll see imperfections in the concrete, cracks, exposed rebar, and these are really just to give the, the environment some visual uniqueness, you know, so that it's not in some, some visual flavor, so that it's not the same texture repeated over and over and over again, and also to add to sort of realism to the textures. In this game, that's an actual gameplay mechanic. Anytime you notice large cracks, exposed rebar, hazards like like exposed wires that are sparking and stuff like that, you need to document it. And you do that by uh, taking pictures with your camera. And now your camera only has, it can only take X number of pictures before you need to reload the battery. So this is where the sort of resource management stuff comes in. Um, you have a flashlight as well, and some areas of the game are pitch black dark. And uh, you ha your, your flashlight uh, batteries are a limited resource, so you need to be constantly exploring and looking for uh, flashlight batteries and camera batteries. And so in that sense, these are sort of the ammunition or or, uh, or resources that you need to keep in check. Um, and it may sound kind of like, well, is it, what is it, just like a building inspector simulator? Um, it, sort, it certainly starts that way, and it does have a very immersive quality in that you do feel that you are taking on the role of this person. You are feeling like you're living a day in the life of a kind of person who has to go out and inspect these abandoned properties um, and, and make recommendations for repairs and stuff like that and uh, and dealing with things that they would have to deal with. Like, you know, they, they may have a master key for the property, but, you know, security may have put, you know, uh, store-bought padlocks on some of the doors to keep kids out and stuff. So you have to figure out ways around things like that. And then in addition to that, because you're a, a civil engineer, a lot of the puzzles are going to involve a lot of actual technical stuff. I mean, you don't have to, you know, be an engineer or anything like that to solve these puzzles, but a cursory understanding of um, some of these more technical, you know, facilities and, and, and technical skills and things like that is going to help you with the puzzles. You know, for example, they might say, Oh, go go shut off the uh, you know go go lower the sluice gates or go shut off the you know auxiliary pump or something like that. And if you you know if you have a sort of cursory understanding of how these systems operate, you might you might not need to be told where to go to do that. You might be like, okay, that's probably you know over here where this other uh, where this other plumbing is and stuff like that. I can go there. Whereas if you don't have any um, familiarity with that. 
you know, you, it's going to be a lot more sort of exploration and poking around and, and turning buttons on and off until, uh, until something different happens. So that's kind of a cool aspect of the game as well that makes it very immersive is that um, there's a, is a real strict attention to detail and making sure these systems are modeled correctly. And later on in the game, when you're going to places like water treatment facilities and stuff like that, there's an interdependence um, from system to system on each other that uh, is is very true to life and reality. Um, and I know it's sounding like this is a very sort of grounded in realism, like, okay, sort of boring, like, okay, I guess we're just, you know, uh, <laughs> repairing machines and, and you know, um, swapping fuses and things like that. And there is quite a bit of that, but uh, the game also has a very interesting tone. There's uh, the plot, you know, like a lot of these kind of games, um, there's a, there's a larger conspiracy at work and, and, you know, you're going to be hearing about all these different players and actors in, uh, in, uh, in audio diaries and reading people's journals and, and leftover letters and stuff like that and memos throughout all of these facilities that you're exploring. And it gets into some pretty serious stuff, you know, the, the, the plot takes a lot of different twists and turns. Um, for me personally, uh, it, these are the kind of plots that just lose me immediately because if I forget, you know, one character's name, you know, then there's some huge revelation later on, you know, and they're just like, oh, well, you know, Professor Willingsworth, you know, he, he was really, you know, secretly working for, you know, the Soviets or something. And I'm just like, what? Like, who? I don't even know who that is. So for me, it was, it was really easy to lose track of, of the plot and, and the larger story. The one thing I would say, though, that, that works for players like me, well, and just as a, as a quick aside, if anyone has, here is familiar with my Payne's Creek Killing uh, video, that has a similar plot with lots of, it's very convoluted. There's a lot of different people and um, players involved. The difference is is that your progression in that game is tied directly to your your uh, fundamental understanding of everyone's motivations, their personal history, their relationships with other characters. Whereas in this game, your progression is entirely tied to being able to solve puzzles, uh, logically work through problems, exploration, and uh, traversal and stuff like that and platforming and different me kind of mechanics like that. It is not tied to the plot at all. And so it's very easy to just overlook the plot. And it is a very convoluted plot. But as a plus for players like me, there doesn't seem to be one single plot line. And the, the one that there is, uh, even for players just kind of like uh, daydreaming through the whole thing and kind of like uh, lackadaisically walking through the entire thing are gonna pick up on, on that general plot. Uh, one thing I really liked about this game is that it's not just like one ooh, one big grand conspiracy. As you go through all of these different facilities, you are uncovering plot thread after plot thread after plot thread of, of different, you know, it's almost like side quests in, our, in an RPG. Some of these stories are self-contained. Some of them have something to do with the larger story. Some of them go really kind of bonkers and out there. So it's, it's not something where you feel like, uh, oh, well, you know... Uh, I didn't pay attention and I, I missed this character's name, so I don't know what's going on. You may not w know what's going on, but really just in the context of that one story. And so also, at the, you know, for players like me, I didn't feel like I, I missed out on anything because I realized that a lot of these plot points are, are very convoluted and not necessarily interconnected. And they're really just there to tell, tell different stories as you, as you go through the campaign. So um, there's not just one single overriding plot, but it is very convoluted and it is going to require you to pay very close attention to notes and details and things like that. So back to gameplay, if it's not a walking sim purely and if it's not a puzzle simulator or a puzzle game purely, um, what is it? Well, another interesting choice that they made is there's a lot of sort of immersive sim qualities to the game as well. A lot of the objects in the environment can be manipulated and moved and in fact, uh, you know, since it's a source engine game, you have uh, you can freely manipulate uh, boxes, and a lot of puzzles require you to move boxes and stack them and put them on top of one another. Um, you know, uh, you'll find things like fuses in the environment where it's not just like, all right, let's say a puzzle requires two fuses to, to complete if you want to turn on this generator. Well, there might be six fuses scattered throughout the environment. So it's not just like, oh, you have to go into the storage closet to get one and then you have to go into the bathroom to find the other. 
There are a number of different ways to find all the fuses. There are sometimes a number of ways to solve things, and as the game progresses, there are even characters. I mean, you never you never interact with NPCs like face to face, but there are characters you can choose to save or not save, and that will have far-reaching consequences on the story, and, and um, there will be benefits or 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 liabilities later. Uh, based on your choices. Another thing is you have the, I mean, basically the only, you only need to get from A to B in the game in order to progress the, the levels and the, and the plot. But um, you're given the option to, you know, you'll, you'll come upon facilities, like I said, like a water treatment plant or a, or a dam or, or whatever, and you'll have the opportunity to repair these systems, you know, for the dam, for example, you can not only choose to turn the dam back on, but also redirect the power back to the grid. And that will potentially have far-reaching consequences through the rest of the story and affect future puzzles. I think that was the intent. It doesn't really work out like that. I, you know, if you, if you f fail to turn on the dam at the beginning, I don't think it affects stuff later on down the line, but I can't say for sure. Um, you know, there is an open world feel to some sections. There are there are little towns and city sections. There's even a section later in the game where you visit this sort of little subculture commune where they've developed their own currency and they have like all these, you know, kind of self-sustaining little businesses in this little abandoned apartment block. And they even, uh, even the security guard at the front door, they call it a border checkpoint because it's it's kind of almost like an autonomous zone. And it felt like something straight out of uh, Deus Ex. And it's it's very similar, too, because, uh, you know, it feels like maybe the Hong Kong level or something like that from Deus Ex, because you can go all over this compound and talk to different people and discover little Easter eggs and, you know, uh, run errands for people and stuff like that to get, you know, achievements or, or get, you know, uh, find more, more coins or whatever to help you... Uh, progress through the story in a different way, but none of it's really necessary. Basically, the minute you get inside, you can pretty much go straight to the to the end and just leave. And so giving the player the option to do some of these puzzles and the option to um, extend their playtime is kind of interesting. Uh, and so because a lot of the content in the game is optional, it has this really sort of weird, like I said, almost immersive sim quality, but that's actually one of the problems with the game, too, in that it's got a lot of these, you know, open-ended aspects that, you know, kind of want the player to be more creative or, or you know, want the player, you know, it's not like, it's not like a typical puzzle game where, um, you know, you might, for example, there's, there's, a, there's a puzzle where you have to light up a furnace and typically what you'd do is you'd pick up a log and it would go in your inventory and then when you get to the furnace you would, you know, you'd take the item in your inventory and click and drag it to the, the furnace. Well, this game, you physically pick up the log and you have to physically move it to the furnace, put it in the right slot, and then light it with matches later. So, and of course, this game is done in the Source Engine, so you can imagine, you know, physically manipulating all these objects, objects, how that's going to look and feel. The problem is, is that ultimately the game is still a very linear experience, and puzzles are not as open-ended as they could be, and they really just follow a logical series of events. Like, you have to do this, then you do that, then you do that. There's not a lot of, you know, for example, if you need to get around a, a locked door, nine times out of ten, you just have to, no, ten times out of ten, you just have to find the key and open it. And so that that's it. There's, there's no, like, oh, well, I saw a hatch at the top there. Maybe I can get on top of the thing and drop through. No, and if you do do something like that, it's because it's exactly what the puzzle was. That's how you get in there. There's and, and there's no way you're unlocking the door. So the entire time you're playing this, you're like, I feel like I have all this freedom, and there's all these interesting mechanics here, but um, but I feel sort of stifled. I, I kind of liken it to uh, being a dog that's taken to the, like a big open park, right? And yet your your owners never take you off the leash, and you're like, I just want to go run around. Like, what am I? You know, you can see all of the potential here but you never get a chance to really do anything with it. And uh, I think the developers agreed. And again, it's, you know, I'm not, I know this channel is, is largely devoted to immersive sims, but I had no idea that I would be uh, saying anything like this about the game when I was playing it because uh, I was interested in it because I felt like, wow, a sort of walking simulator where you just explore all these enormous industrial facilities, you know, abandoned, you know, um, out in the woods, it kind of, there's something sort of beautiful, I was like, maybe it'll be like a really chill game, you know, 
Um, or maybe it'll be a really great puzzle game, but I was not expecting this. And I think the developers sort of agreed that they sort of really wanted to make an immersive sim. Um, I mean, uh, one of the dead giveaways is the first code in the game is 451, but I think the most damning piece of evidence, really, is uh, if you go to their Steam page for the developer, they have Infra there, and then the next game that they released after that actually takes place in the world of Infra, in, the, in that commune I was telling you about that kind of feels like Deus Ex. And it is a, it's an, it's an open-ended RPG. It's, very, it's basically Deus Ex, and it is a self-proclaimed concrete punk RPG that takes place in that, that strange subculture commune community um, in the world of Infra. And it's called Open Sewer because that's the name of the community. It's a it's a play on words. There was a town, uh, there was a suburb of the main city in the game. I forget what it's called, something uh, Scandinavian, um, Northern European, and it was like Open Savrel or something like that. And so people started because there was all these, uh, you know, issues with the government and the infrastructure and stuff like that. People called started nicknaming it Open Sewer, and then I think um, the people that made this commune. Uh, jokingly refer to their commune as open sewer. And so you play, it's kind of like a basically a Deus Ex type game RPG set in the, the open sewer community. And uh, I'm very interested to play it. And I think, like I said, that's a very damning piece of ev ev evidence that, you know, they make this puzzle game. And as I said, as the game progresses, it opens up more and more and more. And they add in all these weird things, like almost like RPG mechanics and open world mechanics where you're like, what is... But at the end of the day, they still have to... They have to yank on the on the chain, yank on the leash, and sort of rein it back into being a puzzle game. And so I think Open Sewer really showcases that, yeah, we wanted to make a sort of open-world RPG type thing. So they eventually did. So that being said, you know, there is sort of a, you know, the gameplay really revolves around this, this open exploration in these huge industrial environments. And that's really what attracted me to it. It just, for some reason, that just sounded interesting. Um, and it's it's not a gameplay concept you'll see explored many other places. I think the Source Engine is fantastic for making these believable industrial environments, and the developers here really have a good handle on the Source Engine. I am kind of curious whether or not this was an episodic release at launch, because as you go through the game, the graphics and the, the technical skills of the developers get better and better and better. For example, the dam at the beginning of the game doesn't look super great. Um, there's some really crappy texture work, and a lot of you know assets probably lifted from... Um, you know, uh, source engine and, and, you know, the source you know, source development community and stuff like that. But then as you go through the rest of the game, there's really great use of atmospheric effects, uh, steam, fog, uh, dynamic lighting, and some of the places in the later game just look photorealistic. And because source engine is very light on resources, there's an incredible sense of scale to a lot of these environments. There's a steel mill, for example, that's just friggin' huge. And there's a um, there's a water cistern, an underground water cistern that you go through, and it's just the room is absolutely massive, but there's no sacrifice in detail because things up close still look very good. And so the atmosphere and lighting that they got for this game, they just nailed. The game, basically, because you're, you're there's there's a extreme sense of isolation and loneliness and so because while you're playing this game you are constantly alone in these huge environments a lot of them very dark sometimes a lot of sort of groaning moaning sounds you know emanating and echoing through the the caves it kind of feels a little creepy sometimes and that's another thing that the game does is it's constantly flirting with wanting to be a horror game and there's allusions to maybe ghosts or monsters in certain areas and hauntings and stuff like that and while there are some definitely creepy unsettling moments in the game it never quite becomes a horror game but it's you you would be forgiven for you could be forgiven for for finding many aspects of the game a little unsettling and uh you know feeling sort of uh, creeped out in certain instances and so that's another interesting feel to the atmosphere just being co sort of stranded alone in these underground facilities just kind of drives home this sense of isolation and, and vulnerability in the player and it's like you said it's an incredibly immersive experience um, you're never taken out of the perspective of your player everything seems to happen in real time based on the the uh, the events of the game 
it's um and there's no cut scenes or anything like that so it, it really is this immersive atmospheric experience and you do sort of feel like you're filling that player's uh the character's shoes you know that you are this this inspector just having the longest toughest day of your life um and I think the best way to liken the gameplay, honestly, if you really want to know, okay, what what is the game feel like? It the game feels like Half Life One, with a little dash of Half Life Two in it. It feels like Half Life One without guns or enemies, because a lot of Half Life One is just exploring the Black Mesa Research Facility, and maybe there's a big p puddle of radioactive goo that you have to get over, so you might drop some boxes on it, or you might use a, a crane to manipulate a bridge to get over it, or um, whatever, and you're exploring these large industrial environments, you know, and it, a huge scale to the facility in, in, in Black Mesa and stuff like that. So the best way I can describe it is that because the other the other part of gameplay is that there's a lot of traversal and platforming, a hell of a lot of jumping, um, and a lot of a lot of hazards. Um, it is a little fr some of the hazards are a little frustrating. I mean, obviously, electrified water that's fine, but uh, sometimes there'll be water that's like two or three feet deep, and if you jump, you drop in, it's an instant death. But you know, there's steam, fire, electrical hazards, uh, running water, things like that. There's some interesting segments of the game too. There's a segment of the game where you, you take a raft down this river, and you have to kind of steer the raft by by uh, shifting your weight from one side to the other. You get a motorboat at one point. Um, so yeah, I would say that the, the the most apt description is this is this is Half Life One without guns or enemies, um, and uh, it really kind of feels like you're exploring something akin to the Black Mesa Research Facility. And I have to say, I really liked the the puzzles in the game. Uh, the puzzles, like I said, there's there's an element of you know understanding, you know, having some some technical uh, acumen and understanding how a lot of these systems work. There's a real logical flow to them, and there are different kinds of puzzles. You know, it's not there are some puzzles like okay, there's a red wire and a green wire here, so you know, let's kind of keep mixing and matching until the light board turns green. Now, there's definitely stuff like that in the game, but most of the puzzles are. It's the kind of thing where the solution's gonna dawn on you, you know? I feel like the, the 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 optics of the puzzle are a little bit larger than like looking at a tiny little wiring diagram and trying to figure out how to, you know, route the power from one part of the circuit to the other. It's the optics are a little bit larger. It's about okay, like um, for example, like there's one in a water treatment facility and you have pretty much control and access to everything in the water treatment facility, so it's trying to identify you know, going and inspecting each part of the facility to be like, okay, it seems that there's a clog here or this certain uh, system doesn't want to turn on. Is there a way I can, is there a reason that's happening? And sort of logically working out why would this be clogged? Why would this pipe be clogged or why would it not be working or why would this uh, gate not want to open? Is there something? And so you do play as an engineer in the game and so it, it is also, it, it's almost like the puzzles are, are designed around again, you know, sort of like logical, technical skills, repair skills, something like that. Um, not all of them though, but I, I just felt like the puzzles had a very different flavor in a game like this that I personally really appreciated and I really liked. One of the other pos positives of the game, and, and another comparison to Half-Life 1, is that, um, you know, some of these underground uh, areas, like I said, they can be very atmospheric and get very sort of isolating and, and very creepy, and you feel very vulnerable as a player as well, because there's a lot of danger in the game. There's a lot of ways to die and, and fail. So, um, well, and the other thing, as a quick aside too, uh, when you're repairing things, there's a way to repair them wrong. And you can actually, like, for example, I think that the first generator in the game, you can blow it up and you just kind of have to deal with the consequences of destroying it. And you may not have power for things for later puzzles and stuff like that. And you just have to roll with the punches. But there's, it does not a game fail. So that's interesting. But one other comparison to Half-Life is that it's, um, you know, in Half-Life 1, you know, right after the, the uh, Black Mesa incident, you know, Everyone that around you is like, you got to get to the surface. You got to tell them what happened here. You have to send help. So, you're you're wading through, you know, um, the bodies of your coworkers and all of these, you know, sort of almost Lovecraftian horrors coming through these rifts in in, uh, you know, these rifts in space time and stuff like that, and and uh, all of this this uh, horrifying stuff. And you finally make it to the surface and, you know, you've been under, you can tell how deep underground you were because of all the elevators you had to take just to get back up to the surface. And you finally get out and what happens? 
spoiler alert, the military's there, and they're there to clean up the mess and silence everybody who works at the facility so that, uh, you know, none of this leaks to the public, and so they start murdering you. And you're out in the in the the broad light of day in the heat of the desert, and uh, you just have to get driven right back down. And uh, it's an it's a very emotional roller coaster, constantly brushing up against the surface in Half Life, and then having to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the facility. Um, and it's kind of uh, an oppressive atmosphere the first time you play Half Life because you're like you know you feel kind of stressed out and uneasy underground. And when you're at least on the surface, even though you have to deal with the uh, fighting the military and stuff at least you know you don't have to deal with all the the horrors inside and you're not going you know deeper and deeper down into the um you know kind of like a dante's journey or anything like that you're you're <laughs> you can be up on the surface you know you can breathe easy and this game really uh replicates that same emotional roller coaster where you know you'll be in these dark you know sewers where there's nothing but the the light of your flashlight and um you know, it seems to span on for miles, and you're completely alone and isolated, and it becomes a very tense, um, sort of anxiety-inducing atmosphere, and then you'll finally make it to the surface again, and be like, oh, thank God, you know, and, and again, similar, you know, everyone is telling you on your cell phone, like, just make it back to the office so we can, you know, sort of regroup and figure out what we need to do, because things start happening, you know, bigger things start happening in the story, um, but then, you know, you realize you come to, uh, you come to a roadblock and you're like, okay, the only way forward is to go back down. And so you have to just delve back down into the murk. And there are definitely points in the game where you're like, oh man, I do not want, like, you're just like, I just got out of there. I just, and you got to go right back down in there. So it's just, it's sort of emotionally exhausting almost because it's like, you got to go back into the sort of, um, oppressive atmosphere and anxiety inducing atmosphere of, of all these, um, these underground networks and systems and stuff like that. So that was done very well in the game. And like I said, you know, plot-wise, there's a lot going on. There are conspiracy theories. There's a general story about corruption and stuff like that. There, There's maybe even some supernatural elements, you know, later on. And, and So there's a little bit of something for everybody. And I think tonally, it's, it's very unique, too, because there's some very serious and even dark subject matter in parts of the game. But then there's a lot of levity. There's tons of Easter eggs to you know, TV shows and movies and other video games and stuff like that. Obviously, this game plays uh, homage to games like Half-Life, System Shock, Deus Ex, um, some others, of course, I'm forgetting right now. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of great little Easter eggs to find. There's a lot of stuff off the beaten path. There's a lot of interesting interactivity. You know, for example, um, you might find a VHS in the environment, just like a physics object. You pick it up, oh, throw it, toss it around, whatever. Well, sometimes you'll find little VHS players or little projectors. You can put it in and watch little videos that um, expand more of the story. And so there's a lot of attention to detail. There's a lot of stuff to see. Uh, there's interesting things to do. There's an entire puzzle that involves you using this, like, um, hacked-together coffee machine that's assembled from uh, control valves at a, at a, at a water uh, processing facility. And, you know, you have to make different coffee and stuff like that. You can have psychedelic trips on tea, uh, apocalyptic visions of the future. I mean, there's just a, a, a lot of depth to the content. So while at first glance it may just seem like a walking sim where you walk from one, you know, abandoned factory to the next, uh, there's all these little things that you'll discover that that add a lot of depth and and um, that add a lot of depth and uh, variety to the game. Um, that you wouldn't expect and like I said tonally it's kind of all over the place you can definitely tell these guys were uh, northern or eastern European there's that very sort of uh, interesting sense of humor that that you get a lot from that region of the world and there's kind of a tongue-in-cheek aspect to a lot of the game yeah it's just an incredibly unique experience and uh, I had a lot of fun playing it I found it to be a very interesting game and a, and a fun experience however it's not all sunshine and rainbows I've talked about the fact that a lot of the areas are very large and open-ended and, and huge in scale, but one of the problems is, is while the puzzles in the game are good, one of the things that de the developers confuse for puzzles quite often is the idea of hiding something that you need for progression under a bunch of clutter in a uh, steel mill the size of uh, Rhode Island. And it's just a little ridiculous. Because 
you can waste tons and tons and tons of time searching for like a little key or a little, you know, fuse or whatever that you need to progress to the next area. And it just gets incredibly frustrating at some points because you realize that it's just padding out the game length. And in addition to that, there's a lot of sections that are really, they really should just be traversal, you know. It's a, it's, it would be a good time for the pacing of the game to kind of slow things down and just have you walk from A to B and sort of admire the scenery and stuff like that. But uh, unfortunately, they put in a bunch of puzzles and, and stuff like that. But, they, they're, you know, puzzle is, is a little too generous. They put in minor obstacles for you to get through. Like I said, like stacking boxes to get over things or turning on a switch and running through a door really fast before the door closes, things like that that you have been tested on ad nauseum in the game already, and they don't really fit the the setting that you're currently in, they don't really fit the pacing of the game, and they're really just there to pad out the game length. And that's another big detractor that I have to talk about. This game has been sitting in my backlog for a while. I bought it, I was interested in it years ago, I finally bit the bullet and got it uh, a few years after that. Um, and I thought I would just start playing it right away, but I did a little cursory look on howlongtobeat.com before, uh, or right after I bought it, and it said 30 hours, and I said, there's no way, but I didn't want to get involved in something like that. Well, the other weekend, or this past weekend, I had two days off, and I was just like, you know what, let's check this game out, and at first I just started it because I was like, well, I just want to see what it is. Is it, a, is it a puzzle game? Is it just a walking sim? You know, what's the deal? And the further I got into it, I started getting really absorbed. And then I looked at my play timer and I was like, oh, I put seven hours in already. And I was like, well, you know, that's almost half or that's, that's almost a third of the way. Can't turn back now. So I just finished it. But I got to say, this game really overstayed its welcome. And that was my main concern when deciding whether or not I was going to play it was I was like, you know, I really like the concept. I really like the um, the proposed gameplay. It's just that I'm not sure that that can carry a 30-hour experience. And you know what? I was right. It, it can't. This game really drags towards the end, and you just want it to be over. And there, there are too many sections where they pad out the length. And again, it's not really a test of you, your puzzle-solving skills or your, your, your reasoning skills or anything like that. It's just attrition at that point it's a test of your uh of your persistence of your you know willpower to to keep going um it's it's quite boring and extremely frustrating in some instances another thing i would say too is that there's a lot of you know sort of there's too many platforming segments they don't give you a very good jump you jump i don't know this guy jumps maybe six inches in front of him is his maximum jump length and uh, it can be extremely frustrating having to navigate some of these um, jumping sections and platforming sections with terrible jumping mechanics. Um, another thing that I found too, in an effort to make these environments look incredibly realistic and one-to-one -one with their real-life counterparts, you know, obviously a lot of these industrial spaces in order to save on space and things like that, and the fact that the human frame is rather slender for the most part, um, the very narrow hallways and, and narrow doors and corridors and stuff like that. But as we all know, in Source Engine games, your uh, player model, your collisions for your player are essentially rectangular. And so it makes it, you get caught on scenery a lot. Uh, and uh, a lot of the little things like uh, levers on doors and stuff like that, they don't make them clippable objects so that they're more ornamental to add to the aesthetics of the game. What they do is they, they make them uh, they put collisions on them, and you'll get caught on things constantly, and it can be very frustrating. Another thing is, and I've noticed this with Source games, with official Valve releases, it's it's less uh, apparent, but with anything fan-made, I don't know if it's it's something to do with the, you know, using Source Development Kit or, or what it is, or if they're just, they have issues with optimization, but because um, I played uh, the mod Portal Stories Mel recently, uh, I had the same issue, even though when I was playing Portal 2, I didn't really have this issue. But the issue is that I get this, like, this kind of, like, my mouse in the center of the screen, the frame rate will just, it'll either stutter or slow down to, like, very low uh, frame rates for just a period of seconds. And it creates this sort of jittering effect in the center of the screen sometimes when I'm trying to look around or, or turn or, or move my mouse. 
And this was persistent throughout the entirety of the game. I don't know if it's a mouse acceleration issue. I don't know if it's an issue with V-Sync. I tried a few things to solve it, but at some point I was just like, I, you know, I just want to get through this friggin' experience. You know, I don't really care. But it was extremely frustrating too. So there's some technical issues and Source Engine, while it, it can do some of these really large levels like we saw in Half-Life 2 Episode 2, um, it's really straining the, the limits of, of Source Engine, and you can tell that it's trying to load assets in and stuff like that because your performance will just drop out of nowhere. Now, Source Engine and the assets used in this game are quite antiquated now, and running on modern hardware, you know, with a, what, 3800 XT Ryzen 7, 8 cores, 16 threads, 32 gigabytes of very fast memory, a brand new motherboard, and uh, I was supposed to have a 3080 at this point, but uh, we all know what's going on with the chip shortages and scalpers and all that kind of crap. I do have a 1660 Super, which is just killing it with every other game I have. In fact, when I was playing Cyberpunk 2077, which a lot of people at the time were calling the new crisis, you know, can it run Cyberpunk, I had no issues. I was running 60 frames a second on Ultra, no problem. You know, never any uh, hitching, never any stuttering, nothing like that, ever. Not even any significant frame drops in Cyberpunk 2077. But this game that is using a engine from 2004, and a lot of the assets in the game are from, you know, the engine in 2004, I was having a lot of performance issues. Another issue I have is that the game is not very consistent with its rules. You know, sometimes water will kill you instantly. Sometimes it's just shallow enough that you can wade through it a little bit. Sometimes steam will kill you instantly. Sometimes it's no big deal. It's really inconsistent with its rules, and it makes it a little bit difficult to anticipate if if they're, you know, or even traversal. Like, some, there was one or two puzzles I just didn't, I got completely stuck on because it required you to drop into the water. And I'm like, yeah, every other time I've been in the water in this game, it's an instant death. So you really expect me to to drop in now. So things like that kind of make the experience a little annoying. And like I said, between the padding and the and my my total playthrough clocked in at 25 hours. Okay. So between the game's length, the excessive padding that doesn't really need honestly, this game would have been better at 12 to 15 hours. You know, I mean take you could have shaved 10 hours off easily. There's a lot of padding, there's a lot of bullshit. And like I said too, you know, it it, it did annoy me that the narrative was just so convoluted. It's just like, man, you, I feel like even if I was reading every single email, I would still miss like half the plot. You know, it gets a little annoying and they're just like, "Oh, Baron von uh, Stusseldorf, you know, he was the, you know, he's been behind it this whole time, you know, blah blah blah." They take, you know, like Scooby Doo take off his mask and I'm just like, "Who is that? I've never heard of that person in my life." in this game up until this point. You know, there's all these reveals and you're just kind of like, what? And then of course, you know, another cardinal sin for me is it's it's joining the club of games where I have no problem with anything up until the very last part of the game and I'm unable to officially finish the game because of some stupid thing at the end. This club includes entries like Sticks Shards of Darkness, which is a stealth game, and yet the very last challenge in the game is a platforming segment uh, a timed platforming segment where if you get hit once by the boss, you die immediately. And it's a segment that can take upwards of 10 or 15 minutes, maybe even 20. And there are no checkpoint. It's a checkpoint save system in the game, which s no, it's a quick save system in this game. But for some reason in the boss, they made it a checkpoint save system again. Actually, there's not even a checkpoint. You just, it, it's do or die. You know, you either finish the entire thing perfectly, not making a single mistake, or you don't. And it doesn't test you on any of the skills that you have been cultivating through the entirety of the game, which is why I feel it's bullshit that I should have to do it. So I just, it's not worth my time. And this game makes a similar sin. Uh, the final puzzle that you have in the game, it involves moving a control arm to turn off a sequence of lights. The lights are not in a Cartesian grid which makes it a little bit more complicated to uh, coordinate your movements because you control the the, the arm with uh, arrows and it's not your arrow keys it's little arrows on this thing so you have to click on each arrow and then you have to tell it to turn off the light and everything like that so it's not in a Cartesian grid which makes it a little bit harder to count spaces and orient yourself first of all second of all um, you can't tell where the arm is because you have a top-down view of the lights that are turned off and on but you are looking at the arm perpendicularly and you cannot match those two perspectives okay you have an issue with your depth perception 
kind of figuring out how far or close it is to the lights that you need to turn off. And in addition to that, there's a bunch of problems with it, but let, let me just say this. You cannot make a single mistake. Um, you have very little time to do it. And uh, I was just done. And on top of that, it doesn't, so there's no way on the light board to tell where the arm is. It doesn't tell you, first off. And second off, um, there are points in the puzzle where the machine will start to break down and the arm literally won't go to certain sections anymore. And yeah, there's probably, you can rotate the arm in a different configuration and might be able to hit that, but I tried that too and I just couldn't get it to work. So ultimately, it's like the end of the game was just giving me a big middle finger, like, fuck you, you're not going to finish this. And I just was like, dude, what is this? This has nothing to do with anything I've been doing in the rest of the game. Um, none of the timed segments in the game had any kind of puzzles like this. Any kind of puzzle like this that required you to, like, you know, turn things off or reroute power or anything like that. They gave you unlimited time to do it. It just didn't feel like... I mean, it was tense, but it just felt like a big slap in the face. There was not enough time to do it. There was not enough time to figure it out. And uh, I just said, it's not worth my time. It's not worth my time to get frustrated with and stress out over. So I just threw up my arms and said, that's it. So it was a little frustrating that I couldn't even finish the game. Um, and uh, yeah, so here's the issue is that I think it's a very interesting experience. Um, and if you've been, if you've seen the footage I've put up and you are interested in all in what's going on in this game, I would highly recommend that you check it out. But keep in mind, if a part of you was like, well, that kind of sounds cool, but I don't know if it's, you know, 25, 30 hours worth of whatever, then you're absolutely right. It's not. It's It's going to... It, it's extremely diminishing returns as the game progresses, and 25 hours to 30 hours is too long of a campaign. Um, the other thing is, is um, if you are going to play it, I would recommend you play it. Um, there are chapters, right? So each chapter is pretty much self-contained. You won't have to worry about puzzles from a previous chapter or items from a previous chapter affecting the next one. So if you're going to play it, I would do one to two chapters at a time and then stop playing for the day. Because if you try and sit down, you know, I had just two days to play it. If you try and sit down and, and punch it out in a single sitting or, or two days, it's going to really uh, drain you. And you're going to kind of hate the experience towards the end and be kind of done with it. So I would say meter it out a little bit more. And play this game, like I said, just two chapters a day. It's ten chapters. It's going to take you about five days. It's a lot of commitment for a game. And that those two chapters could go anywhere from two hours to four hours. It's you know it's a lot a lot of time. And the reason you're going to want to do it by chapters is some of the puzzles are so complicated and so convoluted that you're you don't want to lose your place. You want to be aware of like oh yeah I saw I saw an extra fuse in that storage room you know like 500 feet back down that corridor. You do not want to come back to it a couple days later and be like, wait, what was I doing? Where was I? You know, because then you're going to be totally lost and you're not going to have a good chance of, of finishing the puzzle. So, yeah, I think it was a great idea. I think it was a great concept. That's what got me, you know, interested and hooked in the first place and, and wanting to check it out and wanting to try it. But I think that, like I said, it's just it's not a concept that can carry a 30 hour game. And there's a lot of little frustrating, annoying things from performance issues to, uh, you know, issues with the character movement. Like, I got caught on scenery all the time, and my character would just be stuck until I, you know, crouched or, or jiggled my mouse back and forth a million times, and my character got unstuck. And it's just all these little things kind of nag, and they get more and more frustrating as the game progresses. And, uh, yeah, so... And, uh, you know, any game that doesn't allow me to finish it because of some kind of bullshit at the very end is always going to, you know, leave a sour taste in my mouth. So, yeah, it's not a bad game. And if, if it sounded interesting at all, I would recommend checking it out. There's a lot of there, there was clearly a lot of attention to detail and love and hard work that went into this experience. But ultimately, I think there was some misguided design um, aspects. You know, I don't know why they padded it out. And I don't know why they felt like it had to be this long. And uh, yeah, so it's just frustrating. But ultimately, not a bad experience. And I think it offers a hell of a lot more than your typical walking simulator. And it's, again, it's got more more depth and more character to it than a typical just puzzle game, straight up puzzle game. So that's kind of interesting. I will be checking out their sort of Deus Ex RPG immersive sim thing open sewer. I don't know when though. It's 12 bucks. I'm trying to save money right now. And 12 bucks isn't a huge amount of money, but 
I don't know if it's going to be good or not, but I will check it out at some point and let you guys know. And I, I, uh, I think based on what I saw in this game that these guys could make a really interesting immersive sim. So I really am uh, curious to check it out. I also find it interesting that they went for a very realistic, almost photorealistic in some aspects, art style for infra, but for their, their game open sewer, they went with a almost like mine. Actually, it doesn't look like Minecraft. It looks more like Valheim. So kind of like almost a PS1 era, late PS1, early PS2 era, you know, sort of low poly count, low uh, anti-aliasing uh, sort of look to the game. But of course, it has a lot of modern lighting in it and stuff like that. It is early access right now, too. I think they put it up on Steam in 2018. So uh, we'll check it out. Anyways, if you guys have already played Infra, I'd love to know what you thought in the comments. Um, if you guys have any questions about the game that I didn't address, you know, issues I didn't address in this review, please let me know. Oh, one final uh, thing that sort of gripe that I had, like I talked about earlier in the game, there was that photographing mechanic where you photograph all the different, uh, you know, structural problems and, and hazards and stuff like that that you see on these different properties. Well, the issue is, is that the game, to get uh, the, the ending part of the game, I think I, I read can be made easier if you photographed like, I don't know, 70 or 90% of all the, the stuff in the game. The problem is, is that the stakes of the plot get extremely high towards the end of the game. And you're you're kind of like going through, you're like, do I really need to photograph this minor crack in this concrete on this floor? Um, or this puddle of water leaking from this pipe? Or maybe do I need to get to the center of the city to stop a, uh, a environmental catastrophe? You know what I mean? Like, what is more important right now? So the stakes of the story are so high that you kind of lose track of the photographing mechanic. And also the game doesn't really convey to you the importance of benefits of the mechanic. Um, so at the beginning, you're like, oh, I guess this is the game. I just want to see what score I can get or if I accurately, you know, um, assess the property or inspected the property. And then as the game progresses, you're you're almost like a, a like an action hero in a movie or something like that, like a race against, like in a disaster movie, like a race against time or something. And so you, you really lose sight of that. But the fact that they still expect you to be doing all this you know, when you've got, uh, you know, and yeah, I'm not going to spoil too many things about the story, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, so the stakes are very high and yet they still expect you to, so it's not a very well thought out mechanic or well implemented mechanic ultimately in the game. So yeah, but anyways, like I said, guys, uh, I just wanted to say that last thing. I was just checking my notes here. Okay. So that is all I have to say about Infra. And if you guys had uh, any experiences with it that you'd like to share here, please, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Or if you have any questions, like I said before, if you have any questions about the game that I didn't address in this uh, thoughts on slash review, whatever it is, please let me know. And uh, thanks for watching.